I'd like to invite to the podium my friend Vedad Karahojic. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I want to thank Pompon for hosting this event. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming. It always makes me happy when I see that other people are learning about Bosnia, and it's not just me going around telling my friends, you know, we have a good soccer team. Um, I want to thank Dr. Ben Moore for uh, giving me this opportunity to present and to, to introduce this honorable speaker. Um, so I was contacted by Dr. Moore recently in my email, and I, I get this email, and it's flagged as important. Um, and so I'm thinking, what, what could this be? Um, I see that it's sent by Dr. Moore, so I'm thinking, okay, um, it's probably one of those Fompon events that they hold for Bosnia, and I, I've been to all of them that I can make, and they're great events. So naturally, you know, I believe that it's kind of an advertisement for the next one. So I start reading this email, and, and I'm reading it, and, and then I kind of get a shock in my mind, and, and he says, you know, uh, I want you to, to introduce the speaker. I'm thinking, why am I introducing the speaker? <laughs> did, did he really intend me to introduce it? You know, I mean, like, it, the thought had never crossed my mind, and I, I've been to over 10 of these events. Um, now, admittedly, an opportunity like that should be seized, and, and I am a pre-med, a bio, so I kind of have ties to, to the speaker in, in that regard. Um, so I kept thinking about it, and, and I had to decide rather quickly because Dr. Moore was saying that he needed to go with a plan B if I couldn't do it. So I, I decided, all right, I'll, I'll speak. Um, but this brought, you know, the second problem, well, what am I going to talk about? Um, so I walked up to Pompon and I, I talked to him and, and he said, you should read this book, um, you're, gonna, you're gonna be presenting on this man. And so I, I opened this book and, and I'm, I'm absolutely awed by uh, the horrors I, I read in it. The experiences I saw in it. I'm also incredibly impressed with with the actions of that man in the back of the room. Um, so, <laughs> Dr. Morga says, you know, you shouldn't just tell his biography because we, we have that. You should explain how how it, it how it ties into your own experiences. And I'm going. Oh, thank you for the ambiguity of that remark. Like, <laughs> what am I supposed to write about? <laughs> so. With that in mind, I, I realized I couldn't spark note the book because I had to get kind of an experience for, for you know, kind of get the full effect of the story. And not <laughs> so I, I found that this book is centered around three mental phases, which, which I termed uh, remembrance, reflection, and reform. And although they're not explicitly stated, um, all of these are phases that many of the survivors of horrors have to pass. Um, some, some get lost along the way of feeling these phases. Uh, others, you know, others make it through. And as a psychiatrist, Dr. Assad Boshkaila knows many more of these mental states. Uh, obviously, if you read the book, he's, he's felt many more. Um, but, you know, the, to so many survivors in Bosnia, the world in this room, those, mental, those three phases of, uh, of, of mind mean much more. And even to me, they mean much more. Um, so remembrance, it's hard to remember your past when you grow up in different surroundings. Um, my parents pushed me, Bosanski, they'd say, in order to practice my birth language. I've traveled to Bosnia every other summer. I can tell you how to get anywhere in Priyadar almost as well as my grandpa, who's a barber and knows almost everyone in the city. Um, but, you know, at, you know as, as a child, it seemed so easy to differentiate between good and evil, you know. Uh, Serbian, Serbians had taken everything my family had. My parents came to America with less than $350 in their pocket. Their medical diplomas stood next to the meaningless in, in the U.S. Their past lives were really forgotten. Um, my family had to work their way from construction to factory work. My father enabled my mother's education, working at multiple hotel jobs and, you know, barely getting four hours of sleep a day. But being a kid, I, I didn't really realize that. And I didn't realize that we lived in relative poverty when we came here on Fairview or, or, or the more, multiple trials of everyday life that my parents had to, had to endure. Um, admittedly, I was too preoccupied with Power Rangers. You know, the white one was my favorite. <laughs> Yet, 
It's important to remember where you came from, why my parents struggled, what happened to cause this. To this day, if classmates ask me where I'm from, my response is, first and foremost, I was born in Bosnia. I came here as a refugee with my parents, and I've spent the rest of my life here. Reflection. As I grew older, I began to pick up books on the topic of the Bosnian War. Reza Kukanovic's The Tenth Circle of Hell became kind of the flagship book in my mind. Um, it was the first book I had, I had read, and I had previously read Night by Eli Wiesel, um, which the similarities struck a chord in my mind. How could mankind once again let these uh, atrocities occur? Dr. Esad asked himself in, this, in his book as well. I learned about the failings of the UN, the failings of the international community to stop even the smallest inhumane treatment. Reform took place in my mind after this gained knowledge. Dr. Esad laments that the guards could not take Sebda away. They cannot take away their thoughts. My parents had always told me that one thing a person cannot take away from you is knowledge. Thus, I, I dove deeper into the sea of books on the war. The more I read, the more convinced I was that genocide occurred, that I would not allow a single person that I met to forget what happened in Bosnia, at least not if I was around. I resolved to focus on my schooling, knowing that the, the numbers of Bosnians entering higher levels of education were few in number. A sense of conviction fell over me. I would learn, and through learning, battle ignorance of Bosnia. The more educated one is, the less, likely one, the less likely one is to be refuted. And no one was going to refute that Bosnians were attacked for their religion and culture, not around me. Dr. Esad, too, reformed his way of thinking. He had to remember where he came from to tell the story to his co-writer. He has to remember where he's come from in order to progress. Dr. Esad reflected on the actions that were taken against him and Bosnians, yet he didn't let this stun his reform. He had a more direct impact on his life during the war than I could ever claim. Yet, the fact that he chose to help others to become a writer of wrongs speaks volumes to his courage. It speaks volumes to his resolve. It speaks of his belief to, that even, to even have an ability to right the wrongs, one must use all the resources they have at their disposal. Aid, networks, most notably education. Overwhelmingly, it speaks of his ability to take evil and use it to strengthen the work he does for good. Thank you. help set the stage for the presentation from Dr. Boschkailo by reading a short excerpt from his book. Then came July 13th, 1993, and everything changed for the worse. The Croatian Defense Council suffered enormous losses against the Bosnian army on the battlefield. The next morning, the prisoners asked the guards to let them out of the hangars so they could urinate in the canals. But the guards would not open the doors, so they had to relieve themselves in the hangar. Some men got so thirsty they drank their own urine. For three days after the Croatian army's losses, the guards would not let the prisoners leave the hangar. They had no water or food and the temperature was rising. Finally, several of them banged on the hangar walls. That was when the shooting came, as if out of nowhere. Guards on the outside began shooting with machine guns into the hangar. The men got down on their stomachs and covered their heads with plastic bags filled with underwear and t-shirts as if they could stop the bullets. Hamo, who was then on the left of Boschkailo, was hit in the back of the head with two bullets. Seho, lying on his other side, was struck in the shoulder. The men were bleeding and screaming in pain when suddenly the shooting stopped. A couple of people brought blankets to hide the wounded from the guards. Some of the prisoners had been taken to the camp straight from army units, so they still had their first aid kits with dressings. Oshkailo had a nail clipper. Somebody brought a cigarette lighter so he could sterilize it. One by one, the wounded crawled over to him or the men would carry them, and he picked fragments out of arms and hands with fingers, which was not difficult given that men, the men were emaciated, all skin 
and a little muscle. For deeper wounds, he would operate at night while a man held a blanket over him and another held a cigarette lighter. He would cut open the skin with a razor blade and take the fragments out with a needle and the nail clipper. Remarkably, given the shape they were in, Hamo and Seho survived. By day, Oshkailo no longer had the strength to move in the heat. <clears throat> he was lying down, urinating and defecating in place. In the beginning, they all relieved themselves in one corner, but later they could no, no longer get there. Nobody was able to move. On day four, the guards brought in 60 liters of water for 600 people. Boshkailo urged the men to drink their small portion slowly to avoid getting sick. One man gulped his and collapsed instantly. Then the shooting began again. Oshkailo continued to take out the fragments in a trance-like state. You know how many people were killed in Dretel? I cannot tell you how many. They broke thousands of bones, destroyed thousands of kidneys, and nobody came out normal. I know it was not Auschwitz, but who said that Auschwitz is the benchmark for terror? Do we need another Auschwitz for the world to intervene? It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Esad Boschkalo. I, I would rather just sit on the chair, so. Okay, so, uh, oh, later, yeah, I can, I'll show you later some picture I have. Uh, mostly uh, people from, uh, from the camp on the, on the couple days after release, so. So, the, the book I wrote, I want to talk first about book because I'm not going to talk much about experience, I think. Um, that uh, one page from the book tells you about experience. So uh, usually people ask me why did I write this book? And uh, I tell that uh, initially when I came to US, people asked me immediately, you should write the book. And I said, I, I'm, I'm, I was not ready. I didn't have enough knowledge about uh, psychology of trauma, and I did say that uh, uh, Viktor Frankl, who survived Auschwitz, and who was a psychiatrist practicing in U.S. later in his life, he wrote a book, A Man's Search for Meaning, and the book I read in high school, I think he said everything. I was afraid, am I going to offer something new? But then when I finished my training in psychiatry, I, I felt there is something unique in my experience that I can offer. And that's one, one point of, about why writing book. Second one came, it was actually in St. Louis. Uh, it was probably sometimes 1996 or seven. And I don't remember where, but I know it's St. Louis. I was presenting on a PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder in most likely with uh, what's the name of the agency, who, Resettlement Agency here, International? International Institute. I, I believe that was, I believe, I'm not, not sure, but I know it was a large audience, at least like 300 people. And that time I was counselor in Chicago, not, not psychiatrist yet, and I was talking about trauma and I was free to talk about my personal trauma, to explain consequences and and how to understand those pa patients or people, how to help them. And I did use ex some example like this in the book and some other example. It was really difficult for people to, to swallow this, some story. And that was a lady in the audience, and she didn't say her name, but I knew quickly what was her name. She said, no, why, uh, and she said, 
you shouldn't, you really shouldn't talk about your experience in this very strong voice you have. Like you, you graphic and you shouldn't. And, and, uh, and she, was, she was from Serbia. She was Serbian from Bosnia or Serbia. She later said her name. And I told her, I'm, I'm very sorry uh, if my story disturbed you. So you are trying to uh, take away um, right from me to tell the story, what happened to me. But, but so I don't, have, I don't have opportunity or freedom to tell my story. It is dis disturbing for you. But obviously it's not disturbing to you what happened to me. So that event told me I have to do it. And I, have, I felt I have obligation uh, for uh, each of us to, to write this story because I'm able to do it. I was always a writer, uh, editor. When I came to US in late 94, in January of 95, I became chief editor, editor-in-chief of Bosnian monthly magazine that was running for 10 years in the US and Canada called Zambak. And I was writing mostly that time, not about what happened before, but mostly I, I would find people who would help refugees how to buy a house, how not to buy a house, how to buy the car, and how to uh, help kids to go to school, how to choose school. That was the newspaper. I have, I'm very proud when I mentioned Zambak. So, the book later, um, when I found somebody to write the book, I d divided the book in two pieces. The first piece talks about experience, and it's really important to tell you one more time today that I did not change any name in the book. They are original. So this book is a document. I did change uh, three patients' names, like cases, in the book, and I have agreement from them but I changed those names to protect identity. But names of the guards or politicians, everything is how it is. And um, the book is out for two years, and a lot of people from community, Bosnian or Croats or Serbian community, they read the book, they saw about the book, they saw me speaking on, in Bosnian TV several times, and, and here nobody still uh, make any comment. There are many comments about my book on the internet. But there is no comment about the validity of my story. There is always comment, why am I writing this? Nobody still question anything. How can you question when I have, for everything I said, I had at least 50 or sometimes 5,000 witnesses who said the same story. Another point, very important, the, the writer uh, who did work with me, Julia Libri, she, she told me that publisher once here to go back to Bosnia, to find people I mentioned, and to check the story. It's because it was, uh, some book came out, they talk about the Holocaust, and they find out later those people didn't survive of any Auschwitz or uh, Mauthausen or anything else, and they claim they did. There's a few, few books uh, four years ago or five years ago. And Julia and me, and she went to Bosnia, and uh, my wife, and uh, she found, we found these people, and she asked me how, uh, she always think I'm disorganized, N not, not organized well, maybe I'm not, but she asked me, how are we going to find those people? I said, don't worry about it. She said, don't tell me, don't worry, you always say, don't worry about it. I said, don't worry about it, we are going to post in my small town, and uh, one night, and Somebody will see me, and a day later, it, all of them will be there. She said, how, they, are you going to call them? No, I don't need to call them. This is a town that I used to live. And people here, I saw this back. Tomorrow, I will see all of them. And then she didn't believe me. She was thinking, I'm teasing here or something. She's a very serious woman, Julia. She's very nice. And we came to Portugal. We had coffee in the bar. That night, people come. They hear that I'm there already. It was all people, almost everybody from the book was there. And she had her own interpreter. And she told me that she uh, heard several stories, including this one, from uh, five different people, word by word. And she said, that's it. You know, they same, word by word, same story with no change. 
So after that, we have all validity check and we were able to publish the book. So second part of the book, I'm talking uh, how I use this uh, to understand trauma and to help other people. And, and that's the concept that I introduced into psychiatry, like they have to, you know, have to process trauma, what happened. Put it in the, the, the basic description is this, you have something happen to you, you have to be able to process that in, in a psychological way, not necessarily to talk, you don't have to talk about trauma, uh, to, to process it and to the, put somewhere, somewhere in your body, somewhere where it belongs, and leave it at, integrate into your life. You cannot uh, tell yourself sub unconscious, subconsciously, that it happened to me, I don't want to hear about it, I don't want to think about it. It happened, it is part of you, like I talked today, it's part of my identity. I am a concentration sur camp survivor. I am not a victim. It's another important uh, concept of, of this concentration. I'm not a victim. I don't want to be a victim. I'm a survivor, and this is part of my identity. So that book, second part of the book, talk about psychological reflection to it. There is a, um, in, in US psychiatry, um, Field. There is a theory that maybe people who survive severe trauma, maybe they uh, shouldn't be involved in helping others or treating people with trauma. There are some people they they have, you know, they have opinion, and I do respect that. And uh, and when they ask me, I tell them I don't know. There is not nobody. There is, I never read research about it, but I can tell you that that. Uh, I had at least some support by um, the Dr. Robert J. Lifton, who is the first psychiatrist in the United States who visited Hiroshima after bombing and, and tried to recognize PTSD and trauma and helping people in Japan after bombing. And uh, he, he's still alive, he's still uh, practicing at Harvard. And when I had presentation at Harvard University, I met him and uh, somebody introduced he was he was in my presentation, but somebody uh, told me he wants to tell me something. And after the presentation, he he was probably like I don't know like 84 year old at the time. And he said to me, uh, I I hope you are using your experience in helping others. So that was me some at least validation proof that I I uh, have ability to help other people. Because he's authority, he wrote several books on, on trauma, so that's what he told me. I want to say something in Boston, just a second. Uh, how, how, call me my Boston, that's how it is. Okay, yeah, some of my, um, Razgovaros, Sir Patrick, and I've been on the call at the end of the presentation, at 15 or 20 minutes, so that we can talk about it in the Boston language, and the main thing is to talk about it. So I, I was asked by some audience, they, are not the, 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 they asked me to speak in Bastian later, so I'll announce that when, mostly when we have some uh, little session with just Bastian community to talk in, in, my, in my language, in our language, for them. Because I want to tell them the uh, same things that I'm going to tell you right now. I'm going to tell them that uh, it, is, uh, it is very important to have this concept that um, about this book that I don't talk about uh, myself in the book, it's just a story, it's a frame for the book, it's not about me anything, I'm not that important. It's a story about everybody who survived trauma of any kind. It is more than Bosnia, it is more than war, because there are so many personal trauma that people can relate. So it is not about something special about me, because I did avoid in this book to make myself uh, look like uh, hero or something. There's a lot of people write book about themselves that you look like hero, like I was the best fighter or something. I was not like, I was scared to death. And first bombing, I can tell you, I was in the like little hospital in former factory. I was in charge of that like emergency room in Duhas, Constanza in Chapin. Dr. Mohammed here, he was in, in the rep also. So when I was in that uh, factory as a doctor, you know, the first bombing, I remember I was first one under the table. And the, uh, the building is very strong. I have to tell you that fear was like extreme because there was no war day earlier. 
there was no war, there was no bombing. I was never exposed to, to war unless, you know, a movie like Apocalypse or, or I don't know, Deer Hunter or something. That was my experience with the war. But then the real bomb came and then huge wall in, in that uh, building, like, uh, uh, like stones like this size. And they are falling around and they shoot us with tanks and aircraft. I was under the table first of all, they always tease me about it. Later I get some courage. I, I'm not a hero. And I, I was able to put myself in the book as perfectly normal. And I always like to say I'm a very normal guy. And I always say I'm a very nice guy, actually. And I'll tell you why I'm nice. I am able to talk about this, and you have to trust me on this, I don't hate. Because I believe that uh, hate is just a very dangerous feeling, and that's I think that I was waiting for that feeling to come that I'm able not to hate my neighbors, that I will write a book about it. So I think that would be like introduction. And I would really, you know, I hope somebody will read this book, but I would like to answer your question and have a discussion in English first, and then we'll move to, to Basma. Ben has a question. I'd like to know your, some of your insights about the way that trauma plays out in a younger generation who might, may not have direct memories like you do. <coughs> They actually, we, we have did a lot of people when we have, uh, we had the kind of panel book presentation in, in Chicago a couple of months ago, and Refi was a member of the panel, and Sasha Hammond, and Julia, and, and uh, Dr. Fabry, who was uh, my friend psychologist in, from Chicago, and people asked the question, and we have some, uh, something to offer, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert on this, but I'll tell you that I believe that our kids more know, uh, they, they know more, much more than we believe they know. They do. The, the trauma is in, in us and we raise them and they are always exposed to either stories or some knowledge from other second-hand knowledge or, or we, it's always about something what happened to us and they are all affected. And there is a theory in, in, in our, our science there, there is the transgenerational the generational trauma that goes through even genes. They go, there is several research I know in one on Columbia University by a Native American woman. Um, she has a Native, Native American name. Uh, that she is studying that how trauma of being Native American uh, has something to do with the current uh, uh, emotional state of uh, American Indian people. So our kids are exposed, that's for sure, they are exposed more to trauma than we believe. Even if they are like one year old, one year old or two years old in the war, they know that something changed, something different. And they know the fear on, you, on your parents' face that you have to leave. I said yesterday, just for knowledge again, in Bosnia, the nation of pretty much like five million people, every second person, every second person was kicked out of their own home. Every second person has to leave the home. So if you think about that, whoever was one year old or, or, or three months old or 10 years old is affected by this trauma. And we have to acknowledge that and then try to help them. Hi, my name is Courtney Manis, and I'm an immigration attorney, and I work on a project um, with mental health providers in St. Louis, and it's called the Survivors of Torture Project, funded through the Office of Refugee Resettlement. And I would say about 70% of our clients are Bosnian, um, many of them who were in concentration camps and who experienced cruel atrocities. And one thing that we've noticed with the people that we work with is that a lot of times the trauma manifests itself maybe a decade later or 15 years later that you know people who were in concentration camps they come to St. Louis they're resettled they work very hard and then their lives can just fall apart and so my question for you is um, what do you what type of therapeutic practices are used to help people 
kind of rebuild their lives and to work through the trauma so they can become whole again, if that's even possible. And what type of psychiatric practices or therapeutic practices would you recommend? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. There is, uh, you know, in PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, there is a qualification acute or chronic. There is two types of PTSD, acute or chronic. If acute is if it's less than three months symptoms, and chronic is if it's over three months symptoms. But there is PTSD with late onset. That's the qualification DSM-4. So there are patients who experience tra tra symptoms of trauma later in life. Why do they have experience later in life? For many reasons. The most significant one is new uh, uh, life stressors. And what new life stressors? Most likely, most likely, one who is very similar to the original uh, trauma. The original trauma is you've been forced to leave your home, your profession, your language, your community, your cafe bar, your coffee with your friends, your books, your stories, your music, your sport, and everything you built for, for years, and then you lost everything, then you come here and, and with help of this agency or United States as a country, you are, try you are trying to rebuild your life. Because uh, as Viktor Frankl explained, the, uh, it's extremely important to find the meaning in life. And what is the meaning? One of the very important concept of meaning is a creation. You have to create something. So what do I create? I create my job again. I create community again. I, I create this book and I have a meaning in life. And then something happened that was very similar, losing the job. So losing economic security is much more stressful for somebody who already was kicked out of, of former practice and professional life. And then you have another experience very similar to it, and that's what, what happened to those uh, people. So they experienced full-blown uh, PTSD symptoms. And how to help them? It is if you are trying to help them with just one approach, one therapeutic approach, we're going to fail because there were so many other factors involved in the uh, causing this condition. So this condition has to be approached with, from many different views, views. Sometimes even medication, but psychotherapy. And what I usually said before is uh, when uh, I had a patient from, uh, when I was in Chicago Council, a patient from Bosnia who was a university professor. He was professor of <coughs> math of university and he has to uh, have a job like washing dishes in, in Chicago in 1994. And then uh, for him to, to uh, heal him with symptoms, the best was when we are able to tell him that maybe he can teach high school math somewhere in the four Bosnian kids. So that was the best help for that person. Or somebody lost an apartment when I was in Chicago, and when I was able always to get community together through this magazine. And I said, the patient will come to our clinic, the same clinic, refugee mental health clinic through TIA Settlement Agency. And the psychiatrist asked me, you know, I have to see this guy. He's very symptomatic. He has PTSD. I said, I don't think so. You can't help him. But let me find uh, 500 bucks for him to pay rent. He'll be good. And that is how can you, imagine this, what is medication to help a patient from, uh, any, any patient, it doesn't have to be from Bosnia, but we are talking about Bosnia, who, from Srebrenica who lost two sons. And, and somebody is asking me, Dr. Bushkaila, what medication is the best for this approach? She lost two sons, medication, I mean, there's no medication to re replace your two sons. We have to be there for that person. We have to have a relationship with that person and help them talking, and help them finding an apartment, help them find good maybe job or, or help them with school with other a younger son who is still alive. So there is a social worker component, social work, sorry, social work component in helping those people. So one of the way to help that clients could be just social work. Just help them find a job pay apartment, get the life together back. Uh, 
first of all, I have to say this publicly, I'm very proud to call you my friend. So that is one thing. But what you said is uh, about not wanting to be a victim, but to, to embrace this identity, since we are talking about identities here, of a survivor. Uh, the field that I work in, transitional justice, is basically focusing on how to reinstate victims of mass atrocities into citizens again, so, so that people are given back their rights as citizens and uh, in addressing the injustice and trauma that they suffered, basically be elevated back into a position of equal citizens. But uh, what, what you are dealing with is sort of personalized uh, recovery of, of those who suffer. My question after this long uh, introduction is, in Bosnia, unfortunately, uh, the political establishment, especially uh, among the Bosnian Muslims, uh, has insisted on elevating this uh, population into sort of a, a through this cult of, of a victim uh, to a position of, of sort of, on one hand, national treasure and, and sort of uh, source of the national narrative of victimhood, at the same time trapping them as victims forever. How, how do you see this problem? How do, uh, how do you at all see the possibility of these people being reinstated into equal citizens like my, my friend Nusreta Sivac, whom you maybe know, she said, I don't want to be a victim. I was in Omarska, but I want to be a judge. That's one of okay. what I want to okay. be. So, from your perspective, both professional and personal, how do you think we can we can deal with this problem? Uh, I did talk in, in Bosnia a couple of times. I'm going next Friday, and I'm going to talk about a big conference that we are organizing. Our academy organized Bosnian uh, American Academy of Science and Art organizing conference, and part of his psychiatric con conference. I'm going to talk about it. Because I want to tell people, at least, who is there, and I'm, I'm going to have an interview on TV, and, and will say it publicly again, they have to move away from that, because this is a political concept. Any, in any life situation, when politics is involved, we are screwed. Any, anyway, so, and I don't want to be screwed. So, so we have to stay away from politics. We have to talk away, and I'm, my, my philosophy is humanism. And that's what I'm talking about. That's my perspective. We are human being, and if I'm human being, I don't want to be a victim of life. I want to be a winner, and I am a winner of this situation. That's how I might see myself. And again, it's positive psychology. If I if I tell myself ten times, you know, I'm a winner. I'm a winner. Believe me, I believe in that. So it's very important for them to hear me talking about in Bosnia for uh, political purposes. They are talking about victimhood, whole science. And Nusrita Siva, as you mentioned, um, she is uh, my friend, and I did a um, presentation with her in 1995 or six uh, when uh, with Yadran Katsigir and Nusrita Siva, both lawyers, one is Croatian, one is Bosnian, both raped several times in the camp, I think, Omarska, right? And then uh, she recently had a very good interview in news how uh, someday she asked God to take her because it was um, very difficult for her. But now she said, when she met some of those people, how did she say, when she is walking in the city of Prijedor, and they, those people are still walking on the street, they, they cannot look at her in her eyes, and she can look at them, because she is also <coughs> move on from that, that. By the way, this is something I just want to tell about her. She's an amazing woman. They make movie uh, by Mandy Jacobson, a documentary, it's a movie uh, calling the ghost. It's a really good movie. And I'll tell you just a story, just uh, how we have to be careful. I didn't want to tell you any story about my camp experience because I want to protect you. And there was a conference in San Francisco, International Psychotrauma Society meeting, and then uh, Nusrata is there, and Yadran Katsig, and Mandy Jacobson, they want to show a movie to a large uh, crowd of psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers. And there was a psychiatrist working uh, on that project, and he wants me to be in panel, me, and Nusrita, and Yadrank, 
to talk to the audience and they want to show the movie. I said, okay, that's good, you know, I'll be there, introduce us, we'll be there and then we'll show the movie. He said, no, 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 I want to make that dramatic like. I said, what do you mean? He said, they're going to show the movie. And then three of us will show on the stage after that. And I told him, please don't do it because you're going to traumatize the audience. And he disagreed with me, but I, I, I couldn't win. So me and Nusrat Ayadranka had a bottle of wine. Otherwise, we couldn't talk at the time. It was 96. I really couldn't talk easily about camp. I still sometimes have a difficult time. But at that time, it was difficult without wine, you know. So we got a bottle of wine, three of us, had a good dinner, and they showed the movie, and then I knew it would happen. I just knew it because I already had experience. We, the movie is very difficult, very heavy. And then three, they turn light on, three of us are sitting at the stage like this, 300 people, and first, sure, because it was women, the audience was women mostly, a professional. And I'm sitting just like this, believe me, just like this same like building, and I see like first five rows, that's what I see, like everybody's crying, sobbing, like psychiatrists, psychologists, and, and social workers, they're traumatized. So there is a concept of secondary trauma. If you hear stories and story, you can be traumatized. And I knew that what happened. And ask, if you see here, ask here about that experience. Maybe you got a little drunk and we, we are okay, you know. But other people who were sober and Drew was crying. So, so that guy didn't listen to me because he, he was a psychiatrist. But, and I, I, have, I learned later, later uh, who, is, who is expert, not me, I mean, who is expert in trauma. Expert is the people who survive trauma. Not, not professional, they are experts on the trauma. We need to listen to them. No, but this guy didn't listen anyway. So. Okay, yeah. I have a question about the uh, I often hear, hear a statement that actually the rate of po uh, post traumatic I have a very <laughs> powerful voice, that the rate of post traumatic. Uh, disorder among Bosnian people is actually not as high as you would expect, considering that there is almost not one person that's not affected by war and atrocities and everything that happened during the time. And I was always wondering, is it the truth? Are we really a kind of like a, having a better mental health than other people? And if yes, what would be the, case, uh, the, the reason for it? There's average, uh, I said yesterday, uh, after life threatening trauma, 20% uh, people will develop symptoms of PTSD, only, only 20. So that's a good number, you know, and there is a reason for someone not to or to have to develop because if you are traumatized as a kid a few times and um, um, Parents get in fights so many times. You get expelled from school and trouble. You know you may have a bigger, bigger chance after life-threatening trauma to develop PTSD. Or if you have, they said cumulative trauma. If you have, I didn't study specifically. It's very difficult to study epidemiological study um, in in Bosnian community who has PTSD who doesn't. I did some study, but it's pretty much similar. What is could be protective factor is. Uh, is we have in our culture very nice, uh, good structure of community. So you have a, a faster time to process. If you are alone, isolation is one of the most dangerous um, uh, concept in, in human life. If you isolate, it's extremely dangerous. Um, the, the highest risk for suicide in any illness in psychiatry is isolation. You isolate, that's suicide. So, in our culture, we have that coffee. We talk about it as a, as a, as a, as a you know, way of life. It's coffee, and we talk about it, and that was helpful. And then here, I think we have less PTSD than people in Bosnia, because we get the opportunity to find the meaning in life, to have our profession, your profession, we are doing, like I'm doing the same things like I was doing 20 years ago. Physic practicing physician, and that's what I was doing before. So I came back to my life. And in Boston, it's very difficult to get in, in. My cousin in Chicago has different theory. She said uh, she's an engineer. You know how engineers are. They, they're very practical, you know, right? Okay. <laughs> so my cousin Jara in Chicago, I, she told me, you know, you are second but let me tell you how it is. I said, let me tell you, <laughs> an engineer. She said, in Boston, you know, 
in, if somebody in Boston community in Chicago is cra we say crazy, you know, prolupo, if someone is pro prolupo, then uh, it's really easily to recognize because most of our are uh, normal. But in Boston, you cannot recognize because everybody is pro lupo. Everybody is pro lupo. <laughs> so in Boston, nobody is different. Everybody is. Yeah. And they are, they are. I have to tell you, like, I was there in September, and, uh, and then comparing to five years ago, they are worse emotionally because the economy and everything else. So again, to help someone with PTSD, it's not about medication only, it is sometimes. It's not about psychotherapy only, it is sometimes. It's about whole thing. I have in the book a guy from Iraq who suffered trauma, like he's, you know, I cannot say, he very difficult trauma. He is Iraqi Christian who was in fighting for uh, Saddam Hussein. So. And he he was very traumatized in, in, the, in my book. And he always asked me, uh, he, he has so strong belief in the United States that's, that's unmeasurable. Like, uh, he's, he called me American doctor. He's, he said, American doctor, you have a pill for me. Please give me the pill. <laughs> I said, I, I don't have, first, like, I said, I'm not like American, I'm Boston American, but I don't have the pill. And he said, you have to have a pill. Please, a computer, read on computer. Like, I don't have. I, I said, okay, I'll read the computer. Give me the magic pill. And I was trying to explain that it's not magic pill, but his knowledge is not like, and, and I then, I, I just came with the idea. This was, nobody told me, it was, I, I didn't know what to do with him. I said, okay, give me a piece of paper. And I put a little circle on the middle of the paper. I said, that's you, okay, it's, it's him. And he said, okay, it's me. I said, before the war, or before your trauma, tell me what, what, who was around you. He said, mother, okay, and then father, wife. You know, family, friends. He was a mechanic. Mechanic job, money, Baghdad. As a city, Baghdad is one of the was was the nicest city in the world probably. And um, language, you know, culture, food, music, dance, everything. And I put all those things I, I can't remember now. And I put them around the circles. And I said, Okay, now wife, no. I cross. Job, no. Language? No, he doesn't speak. I saw him with an interpreter. Um, father? No. Culture? No. Food? No. Job? No. Um, role in your life? No. And he said, yeah, that's right. I said, so are you still asking me for a pill to replace those things? He said, no. So in working with traumatized patients, you have to consider all of those things they lost and try to help them either replace them or help them understand how they lost it and what to do next for it. He was a little bit better, but not really much. Yes, Nadia. Yes, sir. I wanted to ask you how you dealt with reconciliation with every time you go back to Bosnia. So in the sense that reconciliation with the place that it, so your home in Pochte is only three miles away from Drete. So How many miles? It's like maybe five miles. Five hundred <coughs> yards. Five hundred yards. Yes, across the river. Yeah. Just the river, yeah. And, yeah. and you still go back to your home you know, yeah. when, when you visit your home. And so it's not just a matter of dealing with the people that were there that, are, that were your, your neighbors and still are your neighbors, but it's also a matter of dealing with the place that yeah. and um, and for, for us at this point, after the war, where in a lot of places there still aren't memorials, I, I, I would imagine that most concentration camps in Bosnia have, have um, minimal um, uh, markings to commemorate. Right. And Drete has no marking. Mm -hmm. and, and then specifically how that's different for you because you're an immigrant. Because when we go back to, to Bosnia, we see Bosnia in a snapshot and the prior memory of Bosnia was, or the prior couple memories were, when we had to leave. Right. Yeah, Dretel has no mark, and I never uh, have, like, desire to, to visit Dretel again. But I did this year. I'll tell you a story now. But about reconciliation, I talked a little bit about it yesterday. It's a time. It's a time. Time heals a lot, you know. Time heals pain. Um, a reconciliation or rebuilding life together again is a long process. And um, uh, seeing people who are guards, my 
people that I used to go to, uh, together with elementary school or high school is very difficult. It was first time and less and less every year. I have to admit, this is a process like anything else. I get, you know, when you lose your mom or your dad, it's, it's very painful and siblings or any other family member in normal circumstances is very painful. It takes time to go through this mourning and grief. It's painful in you know, so. And then a story. So I came first time in Portugal after war, like 2001. And uh, there are, uh, under my river, we are, you know, I was with family, friends and everything. And on the way back to my home and across the Dretel, uh, I saw seven or eight of them. And on my age, went to school together. And that's tough. And wives of them are all there with them. No, ch no children, for some reason, I don't see the kids. So, And I was with my son. That My son at that time was 10 years old. 2010, 12. So I saw them and I passed. I was thinking, you know what, I'm not going, what's, what's the purpose of talking to them? But then I came back. I couldn't resist because I was thinking, um, I have to deal with that sometimes, and it's better to deal with that right now. And I was a little, you know, a little scared physically. I, you know, if they attack me, there are eight of them or nine, so I don't know exactly. I can remember. And I decided, you know, and my son is there also, it's a little scary, risky, but I did, I took a risk, you know. And I came back, so, and they all came. They all came to me. And, uh, so, I don't know why, but you have to believe me this. Suddenly, all of them, they put a line in front of me. They stay in the line, like, in front of me, like, like I'm an army officer, and they put a line. They're next to each other, like, like this. And, and I already felt on them, they are, like, a little scared what I'm going to say. And they said to me, hey, what's going on? Well, I didn't see you a long time. Like, they're playing, like, play, playing that classic game. Hey, what happened? Like, what's going on? Where are you? One guy said, you know, I didn't see you for a long time. Like, like he kind of doesn't know what happened to me. Seriously? He took me in camp. He was with me in school. And then I, I said, you know, I'm here. I, I came back. I have some unfinished job. So tonight I made a plan. That's how I started. Didn't say hi, nothing. I have some bombs and some guns, so I'm coming tonight to visit each of you. And I know your each house. I know your grandparents. I'm going to put some, you know, I have a lot of bombs. And that's what I'm going to do. That's why I came back. That's why. And they got shaking. And I told them, I'm not going to do it. Just joking. <laughs> Just teasing you. I said, why are you so scared of me? I said, I'm a nice guy. That's how I said it. I'm always nice. I'm a nice guy. I'm not going to do it. Because I'm not like you, I'm different, I'm better. That's what you did to me, because my name is different, like I should look different, I'm not, I'm not going to do it. But you are, you know, you are criminals, that's who you are. And let me tell you something, I feel good. You made me, they, they have very low salary, if I tell them my salary, it's really a huge difference. Doesn't mean I have money here, I, have, I make a lot of money, I have the, everybody takes everything from me. But when you mention some numbers, you know, it's huge difference, um, you know, because doctors in Basia, they make like, I don't know, $1,000 a month, you know. And I told them, you know, and, and I said, thank you. Thank you for kicking me out. It was very nice. I'm a professor in the United States. I was just a simple doctor here, you know, I couldn't do anything. Thank you very much for doing this for me. Yeah, they, 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 they almost start like, I cannot describe that experience. They just like one by one, just left. <laughs> like, like animals, you know, like, and he, like I ordered them, okay, just go back. So that was good experience and I dealt with that, you know. I, and I told them, now it's time for you to deal with it, to have bad dreams and nightmares. And you will have them for the whole of your life. That's what I told them. About Dretel visitation, never think it that I need to go to Dretel. Never think about it. This year, on the, my last day, I was there with um, my friend, a uh, couple in Chicago, their um, 
Fe Mary Fevri and David Dolbert, doctors from Chicago, they visit Bosnia and Italy with us this summer. And I had to buy something with my uh, knees, and I had my car over there. So I said, Let, let's go to Tretel. It was just a sudden, quick decision. And I went there, there is no sign. There is, uh, I left my car running and I have my iPhone, I can show you a picture here. I said to her, take a picture. There is a sign, do not park here and do not try to enter something like very important, like, you know, I don't know how they said, uh, struggle with Zeppelin. And I couldn't, I couldn't, I said that then I hear shouting there, why you are there, like, leave right now, and, and then I'll, I'll shoot, threaten me. And then my car was running, and I, I told her, don't worry, just like, and when I sit in my car, I took a picture, three pictures. When I sit in the car, I was, and I saw the guy, he's chopping woods with a, with a big axe, you know, he stood up and, like, doing this to me, and I, I have to tell you, you ask me, and I'll tell you what I did. So he's, when he saw me driving very slowly from the camp, he kind of sat down with the X on the, and next to the road, and I opened the window and told him very something not very nice and showed him my finger. <laughs> this, this one, I did, and I and I said in Boston, you just take it, and then I left with my good car, like boom. <laughs> <laughs> I felt good again, so I think that's part of, I felt that I did what I felt comfortable to do it. I'm sorry for finger, but I did it to him, and I, I said it, that's what I did. And I think sometimes it's important to do it. 